Warning. 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 The following information is not financial advice, and the host is certainly not a financial expert. Hello, welcome to episode 28 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. When I scheduled an interview with CoinCube CEO Robert Allen, I pretty much expected to talk to a scammer about a risky-sounding cloud-based Bitcoin trading bot. Just the idea seemed like a cloud-mining Ponzi scheme on steroids. Would this episode be my first expose? Would my challenging questions be too difficult for Robert to field? Keep listening and see for yourself. Morning, Robert. Hey, Rob. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm well. Glad to be here. So CoinCube is a Bitcoin trading bot that users can access. I honestly don't like um, the term trading bot, even though that's pretty popular. But there have been quite a few um, Bitcoin bots that I am aware of. Uh, I guess I won't name names of companies, but it seems to me that that name kind of carries some unsavory types with it. So, uh, you know, I'm a little hesitant to to just jump on that. But I guess if you want to define a bot as a computer algorithm that is you know, being sold or and or leased or whatever to a user and um, they're using that system, that algorithm to trade uh, currency, Bitcoin, whatever, then in the broad sense, that's correct. And I think it's really important to be skeptical when you go into investing in general and uh, especially with Bitcoin even more so because, you know, the, the barrier to entry is a lot lower, which is a great thing, uh, except that when most people are not familiar um, with a world where there can be just, you know, con artists that come out of the woodwork and build, you know, quote unquote, trading robots and try to sell them. Um, when that, that barrier to entry is so low, it just means that you're going to see all sorts of things. And uh, I, I think a lot of investors aren't used to that. That's, I, you know, I guess you can kind of argue one of the benefits of a heavily regulated space is that it's harder to get into it. And so, uh, I guess you do get the Bernie Madoff scams, <laughs> but in terms of these sort of smaller uh, fly-by-night operations, you don't really see that so much today in traditional finance. Um, you know, we just get uh, sort of brutalized by big banks and not by these small scammers. Um, but with Bitcoin, you have to be a little bit more careful. Anyone with uh, the ability to create a website could go online and claim to have a, a system for making money. And I realized that that could apply, you know, to my company as well. So I think it's um, it's important for people to be cautious and also to to test things. If you want to kind of look at uh, things more broadly, we're trying to compete with companies um, that would be in the hedge fund space. That's essentially the type of trading that we're trying to engage in. So yeah, so how is a uh, someone who's doing algorithmic trading for you? How is that like a hedge fund type situation? You know, automated or algorithmic trading um, is actually used today in about fifty percent of stock market trading. So it's it's really prevalent, and I think a lot of people, you know, kind of just coming into looking into these sorts of things, it can be a, a little bit. Um, you know, like, oh, what do you mean you have some magic program that just makes money? And, you know, uh, I, I can understand some skepticism there. Um, but the reality is, well, there, first off, there are quite a few different types of strategies that you can employ um, with an algorithmic uh, system. So you have um, arbitrage, which is one pretty heavily um, trafficked area for, for algorithms. True arbitrage would be where you're looking at the price of Bitcoin on two different exchanges, and you would buy if there's a decent enough price discrepancy, you know, say a couple dollars between one exchange and the other, you would buy Bitcoin on the lower priced exchange, move it to the higher priced exchange, sell, and then move the dollars that you'd made from that uh, second exchange back to the first and rinse and repeat. The problem with um, arbitrage, well, definitely for, for CoinCube, the problem with us pursuing that strategy is that we don't have control of client funds. We, uh, we issue trade 
instructions with API keys. And so basically that just means that our software connects to a user's account and can buy and sell uh, and check the balance, but we can't move funds. We created the system carefully so that we wouldn't have that risk factor. You could call it counterparty risk. The counterparty risk of, of a client using CoinCube is quite a bit lower than um, you know if, if they're sending money into some company, right? And obviously, since we're, we're relatively young and new in the space, uh, it really doesn't make sense for people to send us money. And, and you know, we, we would have a harder time finding clients as well. So it's, you know, it's not pure altruism. It's also just pragmatism on our part. You were saying um, arbitrage was one of several. But yeah, strategies. so arbitrage is, is one option. Um, so we use a trend following system, which is proprietary, but trend following is a pretty well established um, strategy for commodity trading and currency trading. Why would trend following tend to work more, you didn't mention, say, stock. So is there a reason it would work more in one market than another market? This is uh, an area that could probably do with more research. But um, from what I've read and sort of my, my instinct, it, it would be basically that. So for stocks, you actually have, um, you know, price to earnings ratio or price to book, or you have all of these different metrics where you can actually look at a company and come up with some idea of what a fair market value of that company should be. You're looking for some mismatch between the price of the stock and the actual value of the company. So you'd say stocks would trade maybe a little bit more with some fundamental analysis, not as much algorithmic type? Yeah, I think so. So there can be trends in stock uh, trading as well, but, but those trends could be interrupted by sort of the reality of um, you know, some of the analysis of that company. Whereas with commodities and currencies, it gets a little bit harder to value because you have fewer metrics to actually look at, you know, this this thing and say, okay, it's it's priced way higher than it should be, or it's priced way lower than it should be. And so then I think what tends to happen is that you you get to see these more consistent, um, you know, bull and bear trends um, than you you might in in stocks. Um, now, and I also think Bitcoin. Is, is behaving uh, kind of exceptionally well in that regard. And that's one of the reasons um, why, you know, CoinCube system has been profitable. And I believe it will continue to be for, you know, the next few years. As Bitcoin's uh, market capitalization grows, I do think we're going to get to a point where, you know, the current strategy that we're using will be less profitable. And, and eventually it could become, you know, we could get to the point where, it doesn't make sense to use it anymore. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we're looking at as a company, which is basically that we're going to continue to um, to work on new algorithms and to refine um, and, and and build the company out because it's, it's not going to be something where we can just kind of sit on our hands. Uh, we're going to have to stay on top of the market as it evolves. But, you know, fundamentally, Bitcoin, I was really drawn to it, you know, for a lot of reasons. But one of the primary ones in terms of trading is the fact that there's no central authority that can um, really manipulate it in the sense of, you know, like, let's say, for example, the gold market uh, before you know, getting involved with Bitcoin. I worked in precious metals for about five years. I was a broker um, and, and did trading and stuff. And during my time and, and as I got more and more into that world, I started to realize that that market's really opaque. And there are some, you know, very large central banks and bullion banks that um, have a huge amount of impact on on that price, and and so you have, um, you know, this concept of rehypothecation, which is basically where uh, someone has title to gold and they have, you know, given it to a custodian to to hold it, or they've lent it to a custodian, and then that custodian has potentially lent it out to another party, who has then lent it out to another party. And so you have this trail of paper that uh, is connecting, you know, maybe one ounce of gold to several different claimants. Obviously, you're talking about the same kind of thing that uh, Patrick Byrne complains about stocks and the current system. Right. That happens with stocks, too. So when did you first get into Bitcoin? Uh, so I remember hearing about Bitcoin and, and seeing it a little bit in 2011 um, and, you know, like a lot of people, unfortunately, I just kind of brushed it off. This concept of something being digital, but also being scarce, 
um, had never existed uh, before Bitcoin. And so I kind of fell into that fallacy of thinking, well, if it hasn't existed, then it can't exist. And so I thought, well, there's no way that this Bitcoin thing could actually take off or be valuable because, you know, someone could just copy the Bitcoins on their hard drive, right? And and now they have double or triple the amount and, you know, then they can very easily game the system. And um, then you have the same problem that you have with fiat money, right, where um, the value is completely uh you know, kind of wonky because governments or people can just go in and add a couple zeros on a keyboard and, you know, there you go. And then in 2013, I started to see headlines about uh, the price movement and stuff like summer of 2013, I started to get more interested again. And then I started to read and I was st still very skeptical. Um, it took me a few months of, uh, you know, kind of concerted effort, but I was I couldn't just let it go. For some reason, it just it kept kind of hanging on and, and uh, interesting me. And I read the white paper eventually and some uh, some other things. And um, and then finally, it just started to click that, um, you know, this wasn't uh, just some kind of weird digital token. It was, um, you know, it was this blockchain of innovation that, that could allow the transfer of, yes, you know, Bitcoin, the money, but you can do a lot more with that as well. And the transfer of of other assets, um, smart contracts, all of the things that can be built on top of Bitcoin. And, and that that really excited me because, um, you know, I've always liked innovation that has, you know, sort of taken a, a stagnant uh, market and, and pushed it out of its comfort zone. And, you know, finance has been very much so ripe for disruption for a long time um, because not much has changed in the last 50 years. Quite frankly, I was at a point in my career in finance where I was starting to lose interest because I, I realized that, you know, basically the game was rigged. You had one set of rules for certain politically connected people, you know, so they could do naked shorting. They could basically, which if, for those who don't understand what that is, it's where you it, normal shorting is where you borrow a stock and you sell it to someone and you hope the price drops. If it drops, you buy back in and you cover that position. You give the stock back to the person you borrowed it from. You make a profit, right? So that's fine. Shorting, you know, is legitimate. It serves a, a purpose in the market. But naked shorting is when you borrow something from nobody. <laughs> so you just basically pretend or, you know, create uh, this, this asset out of thin air and sell it to somebody. And if you do that and you have enough muscle in the market, if you have enough shares, you can create, you know, price uh, movements that are really dramatic and you can benefit from that and you can do that with no real connection to reality. And so that's very dangerous. You know, that's, that's a, a different set of rules than the average investor. That's not how it should work, right? I mean, this shouldn't be like a casino where the house always wins. It really should be an even and, and fair uh, playing field for a market to function correctly. So as I started to learn about things like naked shorting and and just, you know, bailouts and the fact that politically connected banks were able to make really bad decisions and then not suffer the consequences of those of those decisions. Uh, I really started to become disillusioned with finance. And so I, I think really if Bitcoin hadn't come along, I don't think I would have stayed interested in, in financial markets. So you got into Bitcoin and now you've developed this trading algorithm how did you go down that path? When I realized that um, I wanted to, A, you know, invest in Bitcoin because I think the technology has a tremendous uh, potential you know, for the future. And also when I realized that um, I wanted to you know, hopefully build a business that was um, connected in some way to Bitcoin, uh, it sort of just kind of happened naturally. But the initial work on the algorithm um, really stemmed from the fact that when I had been investing, you know, years prior in precious metals, you know, I'd used some technical analysis and um, some things and I'd done OK. Um, but the reality is a lot of my investing had basically just followed uh, this sort of buy and hold mentality. Um, if you were buying precious metals in you know, 2011, 12, 10 even depends on when you bought. But you know, if you're buying in those years, you're probably down uh, a bit today. I, I took some, some hits during that time and uh, realized that, at least for me, I wasn't comfortable with that kind of investment um, 
thesis anymore. I wanted to, to be more active and more careful with what I was doing. So I realized, you know, I want to be in Bitcoin, but I don't want to follow this just buy and hold mentality. I'm going to do something different. And so uh, I actually taught myself Python and then I started to take ideas I had about trading and to, to put those down programmatically. And um, I worked for about nine months uh, of time I spent working on uh, Python and, and on uh, building uh, the wave algorithm. So I, um, I, I grew up, I was actually homeschooled when I was um, in elementary and middle school. And uh, I've always been, um, I guess you could say an autodidact. So many of my guests have said that word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's an overplayed word. No, um, no, but... <laughs> I didn't mean that. But just I think a lot of people who are doing work in the Bitcoin space uh, have similar backgrounds and, and ways of uh, doing things. But Well, yeah, may- maybe it's just the fact that, um, you know, Bitcoin is a, is a new a new world. And so if, if you um, if you have the, the confidence to, to just run into something that you don't understand and kind of. Uh, you know, keep um, keep at it until you do understand it. That that seems to make sense for Bitcoin. So yeah. So then, I, I, as I said, I was working on it for you know a good about about nine months total. Um, and the the basic idea with what we're doing there is you know again we're looking for uh, the dominant trend and basically most of the trade decisions are made on 24 hour candle. So you know we're looking at movements that that take place over the course of a month or two, or maybe you know, a couple weeks, but that's that's the kind of time frame that we're looking at. Our average time between trades for for the wave algorithm is about 28, 30 days. Um, so it's pretty uh, conservative in that sense. And the idea is that we want to to catch the you know the the big waves, if you will, in the market. If you look at charts for Bitcoin, it, it definitely does trend uh, pretty strongly um, most of the time. And um, but but trend following can be tricky also because. You'll, you'll see periods where markets uh, will go kind of flat or sideways. Um, and that's happened with Bitcoin. This summer was actually a period where we had a few months there where the price didn't really move much up or down. It was just kind of within a, a small range. And so, you know, if you don't have a, a system that's carefully designed, you can end up um, getting into a situation where you, they call it a whipsaw effect, but it's basically where you're buying and selling um more than you want to. A lot of times trend following will actually use uh, like a simple moving average. So maybe let's say like a 50 day and a 200 day, for example, if the 50 day is above the 200, then that would be uh, an indication that the trend is going to be bullish or, you know, going up, uh, price moving up. If the 50 is under the 200, then that would be indication that the trend might be bearish. But unfortunately, if the market's moving sideways, the 50 will cross above and below the 200 quite a few times. And so then you'll get a lot of bad signals. So, you know, basically without getting too uh, technical, um, wave follows the dominant trend. And then we have some signal processing techniques that we have um, coded into it so that we don't get um, whipsawed when the the markets are uh, kind of trending in a flat or sideways direction. Obviously, wave is just kind of a, a name you gave your algorithm, right? Does it have any significance? Yeah, it's, it's just a name, uh, but it does. I guess I wanted to evoke sort of the picture of what it is that we're trying to do. So, first of all, there's this concept of the efficient market hypothesis, and without going too much into that, it's basically this idea that for stocks, and people usually use this when they're talking about stocks, but it's also been applied to other markets as well. But it's the idea that um, the, the current price of a stock is, uh, it actually factors in all the information that is available and it can even include insider information. And so basically the, the price is accurate and it's efficient. Um, you know, people like Warren Buffett, who you know, looks for value as an investor, for example, um, he wouldn't, you know, subscribe to the efficient market hypothesis. Um, quite a few of the, the more quantitative analysis type investors that I follow like Ed Thorpe would would also not agree that markets are at least as efficient as the hypothesis would try to to say. But the point is, efficient market hypothesis is a concept that if you believe that you you shouldn't trade at all because there's no way that you're going to beat the market because the market's already efficient. So I don't think that that's an accurate way to to look at markets. But it's important to put that out there. 
Um, a couple other things to think about. So humans are, are engaged in trading, right? Markets are comprised of a, a bunch of humans all making decisions about what they think the price of an asset should be. Now, granted, computers are playing more and more into that today. And I think humans are pack animals, and I think they they uh, display herd-like behaviors. And um, they're also, you know, humans are motivated by strong emotions like fear and greed. And so those can, you know, fear can lead to people panic selling. Uh, greed can lead to this concept of irrational exuberance where the price of an asset's going up and it's never going to come down, right? The housing market is healthy in the U.S. And if the prices are going up and they, you know, they're just going to keep going up, right? That was the idea before 2008, 2009, many, many economists, quote unquote, were telling people that, uh, you know, the, the housing prices always go up. So the point is, humans are prone to error. And we also have cognitive biases, uh, overconfidence, overreaction, and humans also move in packs. And so I think a careful trading strategy can take advantage of, of some of these, um, you know, errors in human judgment. Wave is really looking for situations ultimately where the market gets ahead of itself, where the price uh, is higher than it should be. You know, people get excited and they get onto this sort of adrenaline rush and they, they can't let it go. They can't think rationally. And so the price gets ahead of itself. So we're looking for that situation. And we're also looking for the, the converse of that, where the price of Bitcoin drops under where it should be. And, you know, there's this sort of malaise and this feeling of, well, it's never going to come back up. And it's interesting because I've seen both of these um, emotions play out a few times now in Bitcoin. And, uh, and it's, it, you know, it's not going to go away. I mean, this sort of uh, oscillation will continue. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to ride those waves. And, um, and, and also, also, I think it's important to think about the volatility is, is, I look at it sort of like a beacon or a signal that's basically saying, you know, this is an asset class that is, it obviously has value, it has utility, but the price swings a lot. And so the market really is desirous, if you will, of more liquidity so that those price swings will be less. That's because a, a trader could make more of an effect on the market with his trades. Yeah. If it's a small market, you can do more with a million dollars than if it's, you know, the treasury market, let's say, or, you know, a really big blue chip stock. So that's part of the issue with Bitcoin in terms of the volatility is just the fact that it is, you know, it's a 3.5 roughly billion dollar market cap, which is like a small stock right now. That volatility is, a, you know, is attractive to traders. It will continue to attract traders to the market and, and that, that added liquidity will smooth out that volatility and, and those, those big moves will, will be smaller as, as we go on in time. And so that's one of the reasons why you know, wave, uh, the wave algorithm, I, I think, will work pretty well for you know, maybe two, two, three years. I don't know, it's, it's hard to know exactly how quickly um, the market cap will grow for Bitcoin. But, you know, if it's if the market caps 100 times what it is today in a few years, I would be surprised um, if we could make the kinds of returns that we've been seeing, um, you know, last since last November, when we started to trade uh, live with the algorithm, we're up about 78 percent in Bitcoin and about 22 uh, percent in USD. Um, I think it is interesting if you go to coincube.io and then about performance, you have a chart there. Right. And so I think that's interesting to look at. And you can really see when you go into 100% either in Bitcoin or USD, and it's pretty clear. You can see the movements are in unison kind of with the uh, Bitcoin price or they are inverse, I guess, when you're in cash. We're 100% one way or the other. Um, so in that sense, I guess the algorithm is somewhat aggressive. If you look at the chart there, you basically have our Bitcoin performance. Um, so if you value the account in Bitcoins and then the USD value, if, if you're just looking at it in terms of the USD value, and then there's the buy and hold um, value. And that would basically be the, the value if someone had just bought Bitcoin back last November and just held on to it um, and valued it in US dollars they would be down today about 31%. Um, and so we've actually, the alpha, which is basically the, um, the performance of our fund or of our system um, compared to the market. So the market being buy and hold, we're up about you know, 50 some percent um, 
So our alpha is, is, is pretty, pretty good. Today's magic word is robot. R-O-B-O-T. Use the magic word to claim your share of this week's LTB coin listener reward on letstalkbitcoin.com. You have one week from this episode's release to claim the magic word. I felt like your algorithm was just trying to hop on kind of the bandwagon and ride it up and down. But from what you said earlier, it's almost sounded like, no, you're looking for when it's somehow through emotion priced too high and too low. And that's when you get in and get out and wait for it to correct. It's, it's really kind of a little bit of both because what we're doing is um, we are following the trend. So if there is a big price trend going up, 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 we're going to be holding Bitcoin. Um, but we're also looking for when, when that trend starts to turn. Um, so we use trailing stops to, uh, to help us do that. And, and it's fairly sophisticated. What's a trailing stop? Say, you know, we buy in and the price of Bitcoin is, uh, you know, 237. Um, and the price is going up, right? Well, so a trailing stop would try, ideally, would follow along. So if you bought at 237, maybe your stop would be at 230. And then the price goes up to 240, and maybe it's at two, um, you know, 235. And then, right, so it, it's following along. And the idea is that you're trying to lock in your profits. Okay, so stop, stop loss, basically. Yeah, that keeps right. moving up. So you, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm always curious, like, you know, you've got a bot, someone, I, I mean, I'm sure there's thousands or tens of thousands of people who are using algorithmic trading for their own trades. Are these bots, do they feed off of each other and help make the price go? Or how do all these algorithms fit together? The strategies that are employed by, you know, algorithmic trading bots are as diverse as, you know, strategies employed you know, just by traders not using software. So uh, it varies. There's a lot of different things you can do with algorithms. Um, you can also look at things like market making, which is quite a bit different, um, but that's where you're basically trying to uh, maybe aggregate Bitcoin from multiple exchanges and uh, you know help clients to get in and out of Bitcoin um, using a system of aggregation. Uh, you have arbitrage, uh, as I'd mentioned before. You have statistical arbitrage, which is actually a little different where you don't move money between exchanges, but you're looking for price mismatches based on prior history. So there's a lot that goes on. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know how easy it would be. And ultimately, I mean, really what, what we're doing, we're not scalping short term what we're doing is really uh, pretty long term, kind of long range in terms of the the investment window. There's a lot that goes into the price of Bitcoin. There are, there are miners that are selling, there are merchants that are selling, there are consumers that are buying. This is happening all over the globe all the time, right? So there's a lot of inputs that go into the price of Bitcoin. I feel like the price is so rarely connected with anything I see in the news that it makes me just want to say, well, it's just, it's all traders. It's all traders <laughs> the movement i mean that's how it feels to me i mean well it's it's complex though because remember it's it's not just traders that use bitcoin though there are also people who just go on to coinbase or some other website and they buy you know five bitcoin and so that's going to put some pressure on the price uh you know upward i just always assume there's these huge whale traders that make the guy buying five or ten bitcoins insignificant <laughs> i don't know though there are but i i guess what i'm trying to say is if you look at the market, you know, and you aggregate everything, and you look at all of the small fish that are doing X, Y, or Z, they can also uh, add up. Um, you know, and there's, you just look at the, the number of Bitcoin wallets and the you know, user adoption um, rates are pretty steady, um, and so those are new people every day that are coming onto Bitcoin, finding out about it, um, you know, buying. Let me ask you more. Um... Like when I'm looking at your chart, you can see some real pointed things. And I'm thinking of, you know, some of the crazy days we've had in Bitcoin where in, you know, 24 hour period, the price has just skyrocketed or, or dropped. Your algorithm is looking at longer term stuff. I mean, is there, there's ever really fortuitous, you know, crazy day to either buy or sell? Will your algorithm act on that? We do actually have, basically we call it like multi-resolution uh, 
approach. So we're, we're looking mostly at 24 hour uh, candle. Most of the trades are taking place using that data, but we also do look at one hour candles. We do have some systems in place that can benefit from shorter term movements. It's pretty rare to see that. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty conservative. So for example, you could look at a spike in the price of Bitcoin and on a one hour chart, it could be pretty dramatic. And uh, you know, you would have moved well above two standard deviations away from the, the average price. But if you look at the 24 hour chart, uh, it's not nearly as far. Um, basically, the danger is if, if you look at the one hour chart, let's say it's gotten really, really kind of ahead of itself, it looks like a good time to sell and you sell. Um, and then we get into one of these situations, which happens quite frequently with Bitcoin, where the price just continues to go up and up and up. Um, then you could potentially get into a situation where you've sold out of the market and you've missed out. So you, you had some short term profit, but you missed out on the big move. So is there a reason it's all or none as far as uh, if you're in USD or Bitcoin, like, you know, you sell some of it if it's a big spike? Or... I've done some testing with approaches such as the one you suggest, you know, this extensive back testing that I did with Wave was that we were best off if we were aggressive and just positioned in or out based on the dominant trend. Now, I am working you know, pretty actively on developing um, sort of like, I guess I could call it wave 2.0 or you know, a hopefully better version of, of this initial algorithm. And I am looking exactly at, at what you're talking about, which is, is there a safe way for us to be a little bit more aggressive with the short term moves in the price? Can we, can we still ride the big dominant uh, trend but also benefit a little bit more from some of these price spikes and dips uh, along the way. So, you know, the, there are trade-offs and that's really what I'm trying to navigate. Let's say you have 100 users and your algorithm says it's time to trade in or out of Bitcoin. Do all 100 users get the buy or sell order over the API at the same time? Or what happens? That's um, something that I, I don't want to say too much about because that, that, that information could be useful for... Um, for other traders who might try to follow what we do. But, but the basic idea is that, I guess I can say this without giving too much information away, We're, our system carefully uh, moves in and out of a position in such a way that we aren't, uh, we aren't affecting the market very much with the moves. Each individual's performance might be slightly different than what we see here based on some people are going to get traded in or out before others in your system. The actual execution of these trades for all the different users is split out in a way that's pretty fair. So like, let's say we have 100 users and there's only enough liquidity uh, for half of the Bitcoin that we're trading to be traded right now or within the next hour, let's say, then... Um, you know, each user will be positioned halfway into Bitcoin. It's not like the first 50 users are into Bitcoin and they've got a good price and the, the, the rest of them are waiting around um, for, you know. So a user might see several buys or sells to get in and out of the position. Yeah. Now, I've got to ask, really cynically speaking, if you got a whole bot army that you're controlling, it seems like you could be the first person to execute with your personal Bitcoins. I mean, kind of like, you know, I guess what people are saying people do in financial institutions. The, the short answer is that we don't treat anyone different in our system, including myself. I'm another user. Um, uh, I mean, there's, you know, aside from showing people our code base, there's really, I don't know if there's any way that I can prove that. Um, but that, that is in fact the case, uh, you know, I, there comes a point, I guess, with a lot of financial tools where you look at the, the totality of the information available to you about a company and decide, do these people seem, um, credible or not? And we don't take advantage of our client base in that way, you know, try to judge our character. Um, I was raised, you know, in a, a pretty, um, I, I think, uh, Middle America ethical family, and um, that's that's how I try to live my life. I don't I don't want to take advantage of people. I want to build, uh, you know, financial tools that um, are really fair and honest, and uh, that's our goal. So you have a uh, this price performance chart here, and is there any way to verify this that this wasn't just like 
Made wanna, up. <laughs> here's my bigger picture is that, you know, do you, you ever read like uh, Fooled by Randomness? Yes, I actually have read that book by Nassim Taleb. Yeah, so I always thought it was really, you know, interesting. You know, you take 20 strategies, 20 money managers, whatever, and just by randomness, one of them is maybe going to do really well for a given time period. And sure. And so, I, I mean, I can't help but just wonder, say, maybe you tried 20 algorithms, you picked the one that worked really good for a time period, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's an effective algorithm. It just randomly performed good over this time period. So how do we separate the randomness from an effective trading algorithm? I think that's a very good question. Uh, and I liked um, Nassim's book. Um, so the first thing to look at is I don't believe that the strategy that we're using will be effective forever. So that's important to note. Um, the way I view it is that, that markets do evolve over time and they do change. And as Bitcoin grows, the characteristics of trading in the market will need to, uh, to adapt. I have a quantitative analyst who's been working with us now uh, for, oh, I guess, maybe nine months, roughly. His name's Giovanni Miacci. Um, and uh, he's a mathematician, and he's been doing quite a bit in the way of uh, hypothesis testing. There's a lot of different um, ways that you can look at an algorithm and basically try to determine, uh, you know, is this just randomly lucky uh, or, you know, is there potentially something that's going on here, you know, that is beyond just, just random or beyond just kind of, you know, as you said, with Nassim Taleb, where you could just have the strategy that just is happening to work for some reason. The one uh, test that I can talk about, which is kind of interesting, I, I call it the the 10,000 monkey test, because that, that's the way that I like to conceptualize it. But so we have our, our data set, which is just the price of Bitcoin. But taking data from, I think it was April 2013 to present. And um, we have uh, a Monte Carlo simulator, which is basically a essentially a random number generator, a little bit, a little bit more complex than that. But we take that data set and we run 10,000 tests where we have randomized buy and sell uh, orders placed on top of that. And so essentially the idea is, well, maybe the wave algorithm is just purely lucky and we just happened to you know, stumble onto something that was lucky and it, it picked a couple good dates, right? And so we're doing these 10,000 simulations and comparing those simulations of trades to the actual trade history of wave. And wave is in the 99.5 percentile. Um, and so what that tells you is it's fairly unlikely that we're just lucky. Um, it's still possible. It's still theoretically possible that we're just purely lucky, uh, but the odds are pretty low. I'm assuming there's no way someone can verify your performance chart. That's actually a good question. So what we're looking at doing is, is bringing in a third party firm to audit uh, our trade history. So that's something that um, I'm working on right now, um, but it, it is on our list of, of things to do. And, and uh, yeah, that's, I think that's important. I'm just trying to think there'd be a programmatic way to do it. Uh, I don't know if anyone listening has an idea or if you think of something, let me know. But <laughs> for now, we'll probably just need to look for, uh, for the auditing approach. So I didn't tell you this. I have no idea if you would know this, but I actually signed up yesterday for an account. Oh, great. At first, when I was looking through it, you know, I, I did feel very skeptical. I was like, okay, so a quarter of the profit fee. And I was like, well, how the heck can they claim that? How, how can you withdraw that from the account yet not have control over a user's funds? And then I realized that uh, you kind of have in a position where you're having to trust your users to send you the Bitcoin. Right. And the only penalty if they don't is that they are prevented from using the system. Right. I, so I was surprised that um, this didn't seem risky, really, um, except for the risks that you go over. And, and that's the other thing. You have uh, a list of terms, which I looked at and I was like, oh, you know, usually 
you know, fuzz out when you read a company's terms, but, <laughs> but they were all really pretty straightforward. And, um, you mentioned risks such as, you know, there's the Bitcoin price risk, technical risks with Bitcoin, who knows, someone could figure out a way to, to crack something, right. uh, the risks of your exchange. And we know things from Mt. Gox or government seizures, there's all kinds of things that could happen. Right. Uh, obviously uncertainty about your algorithm. And I even think of like, I've heard people talk about using an API that they're, you know, sometimes people figure out a way to exploit that. It's just another attack surface. Yeah. But most people involved in Bitcoin who are trading Bitcoin aren't subjecting themselves to a lot of these risks anyway. So sure. I, I was pleasantly surprised with your terms and with, with the way it works. I'm glad and happy to hear that. I've been very careful from the very beginning to try to design CoinCube so that our user risks are as limited as they can be. If we're erring on the side of, uh, you know, giving our user the benefit of the doubt or giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, we would rather um, give that to the user. So, uh, yes, in terms of API keys, that's an important point. Um, so our our system is designed so that if you try to enter API keys that have withdrawal enabled, and some uh, exchanges you can do that. Um, we will reject the keys. So we don't even want to have the option. Let's say we were hacked and uh, somehow someone was able to get those, those API keys. Um, we don't want you know, that to happen because of us and for someone to lose their money. So we won't, you know, programmatically speaking, we won't accept uh, withdrawal enabled API keys. And uh, we encrypt the user API keys as well. And so we don't store those in plain text in our database um, but yeah, that's really a good, uh, you know, feature and something that I, I think is exciting about Bitcoin in general is the idea that we really should see less counterparty risk for financial transactions and, and financial tools as we move into the future. You know, I want to be on the kind of the right side of that. And then in terms of payment, you know, I guess uh, people could try to game our system right now in terms of the number of, of users who have paid versus the total that have signed up percentage wise i think we're at like like about 95 percent of our users have paid up when they were asked to pay I'm, I'm not naive to think that everyone will will pay and i realize but i in a sense i kind of see it potentially as a cost of doing business um but we'll see you know if it becomes an issue where you know half of our users aren't paying us uh, we might have to change uh, our business model, and I, I hope we don't. But you know, it, it could mean that eventually we evolve. You know, maybe we start to function more like a traditional hedge fund or something, where people send in money and we hold it, and we have a custodian. And the other issue with going that route is that it's quite a bit more expensive. We would have to be registered as a commodity uh, trade advisor, which runs, I think, somewhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars to get that set up. We'll see. Eventually, that, that may be the route that we have to go. But for now, in terms of just navigating the legal landscape, we can operate safely and legally by, uh, by not holding client funds, by using API keys and, and doing things like we do them. Your two uh, pricing models were basically a quarter of any profits or 3%. So are you able to tell me roughly how many users go for one option versus the other? I think most, it's somewhere in the 90 or even higher percentage of our users are, are actually doing the um, performance-based fee. And I, I think the reason is probably that if you are finding a new company and you're wondering, okay, is this going to actually work out? Is this going to be profitable? It's maybe easier to swallow this idea that I'm only going to pay if I benefited from actually using the system. Um, whereas if you're paying a, a flat fee, you might be paying even if there's a, a loss. And so I think that psychology, it's interesting to see how that's played out. And we initially just had the performance fee option, and then we added the, the flat fee because for a time we actually were thinking that we were going to have to set ourselves up as a registered investment advisor. Uh, this is before the CFTC kind of came out and reiterated their position that Bitcoin is a commodity. And so therefore, we're, we're really under their regulatory regime, not the, uh, the SEC. The point is, RIAs um, are legally only able to charge uh, some kind of a flat fee. And so we were thinking, well, maybe we're gonna have to do that anyway. So we'll try it out. 
So I'm, I'm curious to see. I think what what's better for users, they actually might be better off with the, with the flat fee. But yeah, yeah, no, it's a really weird psychological experiment. I mean, obviously, if if you're going to continue with these kind of returns, you're saying the <laughs> the flat fee is a much better deal. But I, I felt it in myself. There's just something psychological. It's like, oh, but you know, it, it's it's interesting. And so I guess a big question: Why don't you just get rich with this on your own? I definitely heard that before. The best answer is basically that the strategy can handle more capital than just the amount of money that I have. Um, I do have some Bitcoin, but I'm not. Uh, I'm also not independently wealthy, so it's feasible to use the system for other people. You know, that's a win-win because I can make some extra money from the strategy that's already working for myself. I can, you know, extend that to other people and find some benefit. And also I can, you know, help other people and, and provide a good service to them. If Bitcoin were to somehow just have a downward price trend from here on out, which obviously most people in Bitcoin aren't expecting, but how would you expect this to perform? So from November of last year till present, the price started at 375 roughly. And we're down to you know 270. Um, so in a down year, we were able to uh, outperform the market by over 50%. You know we're up plus 20% in U.S. dollar terms. As long as we've got some nice trends to follow, uh, even if the market is bearish, we can still profit. Um, and that's that's a really nice thing because it helps me to sleep at night. Because I mean I I love Bitcoin and I. Really, uh, I believe it will, you know, be a success, um, and I sure hope it will be. But I don't know that. You know, it's possible that um, we could all be riding a, a roller coaster that just goes down, 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 and another crypto technology replaces it or something. Who knows? It's possible. So it's good to to be in a strategy that we're not going to get wiped out if the market continues to trend down. Okay, Robert. Well, that's coincube.io. Is there any other contact information or anything else you'd like to say? Well, I mean, people are welcome to reach out. We're on Twitter, Facebook. My email is robert at coincube.io. So if you're on the website, have questions, need help, I'm very happy to help people. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to speak with me today, Rob. Sure. And again, I I don't want to plug anybody's business because I really have no idea. But I did, you know, I did sign up myself just to kind of check it out. And it was pretty easy. And it, you know, it seems secure from the fact that it doesn't seem like you can steal my money. So (laughs) the risk to people is that uh, our strategy stops working and that's possible uh you know i think the odds are pretty much in our favor and you know the way i see this is i'm, I'm building uh, hopefully a career as a money manager and uh you know so it doesn't benefit me to, to sleep on the job so we're going to do our very best for people and i don't uh, take the trust of others um with their money as, as a light thing you know every time i see another person sign up i feel a little bit more pressure to to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for people so be cautious, you know, put a little bit on if you are interested. Our minimum is 0.1 Bitcoin. So if you've got, you know, roughly $25 and you feel like uh, seeing, you know, how the, how the thing works, check it out, give us feedback. You know, we're, we're just out of beta. So we're happy with the software, but there's always room for improvement. So we're, uh, you know, looking for feedback. It is nice that, uh, you know, you guys, I guess, because you have no compliance issues, you don't have to give it your name or any information, just an email address, basically. And for now, at least that's where we're at. So that's also nice. Yeah, Coinbase, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, and Coinsetter are the four supported exchanges right now. We'll we'll add some more in the next few months. Okay, thanks, Robert. Thank you, Rob. Thanks so much for listening to episode twenty-eight of the Bitcoin Game. I have no clue if the trading algorithm employed by CoinCube will truly be profitable going forward. There's obviously some trust involved. But if you've always wanted algorithmic Bitcoin trading in your life, this appears to be an easy way to give it a try. Please let me know what you thought of this episode by commenting in the show notes or sending me a message on Twitter. You'll find all episodes of The Bitcoin Game at thebitcoingame.com. On Twitter, you'll find me as the BTC Game. See you next time.